And welcome to everyone, and welcome to Dr. Steve Kemble um, for this uh, PNHP webinar series. This one is responding to political attacks on single payer. Uh, Dr. Kemble is a internist and psychiatrist at the University of Hawaii, an assistant professor there. Um, he's a longtime member of PNHP and one of the uh, PNHP's board advisors. He's a past president of the Hawaii Medical Association and um, was appointed in 2011 to the Hawaii Health Authority. Um, if Steve, you're ready, uh, you can take it away. Okay. There's nothing to disclose. Um, Sanders uh, has been obviously a supporter of single payer for a long time uh, and Friedman is uh, an economist who's done, who's done a bunch of economic analyses of single-payer proposals for other states and nationally. Um, he did analyses of H.R. 676 in 2012 and again in 2013. And he also did a complete analysis of Sanders' economic proposals this January 28th, uh, addressing the entire economic plan, not just single-payer. And Sanders' website itself has also had projections for economic implications of single payer, which are somewhat different from Friedman's. Sanders supported HR 676 and introduced his own bills to establish a national single payer program, but uh, implemented on a state by state basis, which is S703. And he had another one in 2013, which I never did find a bill number. I don't, I don't know if it actually got submitted. And um, Friedman's analysis of Sanders' total proposals in January uh, seemed to be largely based on his analysis of H.R. 676. So Friedman's 676 analysis, the financing maintains the current federal financing for health care, increases income tax on the top 5%, uh, increased tax on unearned income, you know, investment income, things like that modest progressive payroll tax on payroll and self-employment, and a small tax on stock and bond transactions, all of which would go into health care. And Friedman projected $394 billion per year in increased health care costs due to extending coverage to everyone, eliminating co-payments and deductibles and other out-of-pocket costs, improved benefits with dental and long-term care, and eliminating inequities in access. So that's 394 additional costs, and these are the savings which you would deduct: 221 billion from hospital and physician administration, 115.8 billion for drugs, uh, 255 billion for administrative costs of insurers, Medicaid, and employers, and then savings on federal tax expenditures for health care of 259 billion. So that the savings add up to quite a bit more than the costs. His uh, bottom line conclusions were that after tax household income uh, would result in savings for 95% of income earners and increased taxes for the top 5%. And um, there would be a net $592 billion savings per year and would redu reduce the deficit by $154 billion in the first year, slow the growth of health costs thereafter, and save 1.8 trillion over 10 years. Now, Sanders' website has somewhat different numbers. He projects savings of 6 trillion over 10 years, which is much more than what Friedman projected. And he figured a family making 50,000 a year, their total health care costs would drop from 6,273 to only 466 per year for over 5,800 per year savings. Costs for businesses, um, to a business for an employee making $50,000 would drop from $12,591 to $3,100. Those are huge drops in cost. And the total national health spending would um, drop to $1.38 trillion per year, down from $3 trillion per year now, for a savings of $1.62 trillion per year. This is substantially more than Friedman projected. And this is what's on Sanders' website right now. So Friedman then looked at uh, Sanders' single-payer plan specifically and came up with somewhat different uh, with the national health expenditure 
Again, this is national health expenditure, total spending of 10 trillion over 10 years, uh, compared to CMS projections of 51.5 uh, trillion, it would be down to 41 trillion over 10 years. And current 10-year government spending is now about 27 trillion, and this would increase. Yeah. Uh, it increased to 13 trillion due to covering the uninsured and increased utilization, but that would be offset by 10-year savings from eliminating tax deductions, administrative savings, etc. And he figured the net would be we'd have about a 10 billion reduction in the, or increase in government surplus, reduction in government um, uh, deficit over the next 10 years. But it's really kind of confusing exactly what the projections really are. Ken Thorpe um, published an analysis of San Sanders single payer plan in late January. And Thorpe worked for Bill Clinton and now supports Mrs. Clinton. He previously projected much bigger savings to single payer. And he also analyzed Vermont's plan, which was not single payer. It was like a gesture in the direction of single payer. He claims that Sanders' plan is underfinanced by over a trillion per year. He estimates administrative savings only 4.7%, whereas he estimated more than 10% savings. Assumes that elimination of deductibles and copays would increase health spending by 10%. Assumes marked increase in spending by the previously uninsured. Doesn't take into account savings from government price control pharmaceuticals and ignores the tax subsidies for employer-based health insurance. Then there is a, a, a letter to Sanders from full past Council of Economic Advisors chairs uh, sent to both Sanders and Friedman. Uh, this is Alan Kruger, Austin Goolsby, Christina Romer, and Laura Dandrea Dyson, Tyson, uh, claiming that they were making extreme claims that couldn't be supported by the evidence, and um, they did not have any specific rebuttal to Friedman's numbers other than to say they were outrageous. Henry Aaron to the Brookings Institute said, uh, wrote an article for Newsweek saying the impossible pipe dream of single-payer health care reform, that it would he said a radical replacement of large existing programs is unprecedented, that the ACA has been minimally disruptive and preserved employer-based insurance. How much would it cost the government? Where would the savings come from? Claims from red tape would be minor, and therefore savings would have to come from cuts of services or reduced prices, resulting in drastic rationing, massive bankruptcies among hospitals, drastic loss of doctors and nurses, and said that others countries' single-payer systems have evolved incrementally, not drastically, in the way that Sanders proposed. Now, I have put everything in red that I think is actually a false statement from this article. The ACA is uh, turning out to be very disruptive to health care delivery, um, and it's not at all uh, a benign incremental transition. And the uh, savings from red tape with single-payer by uh, what I consider to be Appropriate analyses are more like 25% um, of healthcare costs, not 4.7%. And even if we only got part of those savings, we should be able to save at least 10%. So the savings would come from uh, reduced administration, not from cuts to services or prices. Clinton has claimed single payer raises taxes on the middle class and it hurts the poor, but in fact, um, Sanders' taxes on wages and payroll are less than, uh, than both employers and uh, employees currently spend on health care. More than 97% of the working and non working poor would get a better deal under the Sanders plan, and the 3% that wouldn't would be the ones that are just over the Medicare line that are working and might have higher. Um, uh, taxes than what they're what they're spending now, where they have uh, minimal taxes. But even among those three percent that wouldn't get an automatic better deal, if they have any significant healthcare expenses, their savings on deductibles and copays would more than make up for whatever losses they have in in paying the taxes compared to their current costs. Another argument is single payer is not politically feasible. Um, the problem with this argument is that is Obamacare politically feasible? There are no effective cost controls. Uh, the payment and delivery f reforms are not only unlikely to save any money, but they are already increasing administrative costs and proving highly disruptive to doctors and hospitals. Uh, 
and there's rising public anger over high deductibles and copays, narrow networks, restricted formularies, and exorbitant drug prices. So something's going to have to give pretty soon, even if we stay with Obamacare, and it's going to take more than incremental changes. There have been a whole bunch of responses to the uh, Thorpe article and the other attacks on Sanders and Friedman. Uh, Galbraith wrote a response to the Gang of Four. There's a whole bunch of other articles that are listed here that are available in the PNHP Articles of Interest. And some of the things that they point out are that Thorpe assumes administrative savings that are much smaller than everyone else thinks we, we could get from a true single-payer program. And then he based his assumption on the Vermont non-single-payer proposal, which failed because it didn't achieve any administrative savings. And other countries spend at least 15% less than we do on administration, so it, it really should be possible to do much better than 4.7%. He also assumes huge increases in utilization of 10 to 25%, but this would be stopped by the lack of capacity in terms of doctors and hospitals to absorb that much more utilization. And when Canada implemented single payer, uh, they didn't suddenly expand the numbers of doctors and hospitals so that utilization didn't change much much, but doctors did start seeing their healthier patients less and their sicker and poorer patients more, so it kind of balanced out. And hospital capacity constraints prevented increased utilization. Thorpe assumed single payer would relieve states of 10% of their Medicaid and CHIP spending, but this is uh, something he made up that no one else has assumed. He ignores the huge savings to state and local governments due to relief from health insurance costs for employers and retirees and the huge tax subsidies that support private insurance. And he didn't take into account the savings that could be had from pharmaceutical purchasing with bulk purchasing by government and negotiated prices. Friedman estimates this is about a third of pharmaceutical costs. Also, the, on a broader level, um, other countries spend uh, far less of their gross domestic product in healthcare than we do. Uh, and this is the argument that Sanders himself has been using in the debates where he says, if other countries can do it, we must be able to do better than what we're doing now. And I think he's right about that. Also, uh, many of the critics of Sanders and Friedman have in the past had their own detailed analyses of single payer, concluding it would save money, and they seem to have flip-flopped on those analyses now. And they're all current Clinton supporters with political reasons to criticize Sanders despite their past defense of the economics of single payer. Another more recent article, Justin Wolfers in the New York Times said, uncovering the bad math or logic of an economic analysis embraced by Bernie Sanders. And uh, this is looking at Friedman's analysis. And they claim that he was assuming long-term uh, economic benefits from a short-term stimulus. In other words, if you s suddenly shift to a more cost-effective health insurance system, that that should result in a temporary effect on the economy, not a long-term effect on the economy. And therefore, this is a flaw in Friedman's reasoning. But others, um, including uh, Ron Bayman and Robert Reich and Nadia Prupis, all pointed out that in World War II and with the New Deal where you had a short-term stimulus that resulted in a long-term economic improvement. So it may be quite plausi plausible that Friedman and Sanders are right, that if you have a, a, a short-term improvement in the way we finance healthcare, that result in long-term economic benefits. So you can come up with any result you want if you adjust your assumptions to fit your political agenda. It's not practical to get into all the details of the models that I've outlined. So I've tried to summarize what the talking points should be. Uh, the first is that single payer is a simple program and would be simple to implement. And this has uh, been demonstrated by the rollout of Medicare, which was a very similar implementation. It covered everybody over the age of 65. The rollout took 11 months. It reached 99% of eligible beneficiaries within those 11 months. The cost of that rollout was $120 million, and in 2015 dollars, that would be $882 million, whereas the cost to set up the insurance exchanges under Obamacare was more than $6 billion. And a single-payer system would be far easier to deal with for doctors and hospitals as well as for patients. 
single payer would not be disruptive to current coverage. It would cover all medically necessary services, including drug, dental, and long-term care, and eliminate barriers to care. There would be free choice of doctors and hospitals. There would be no more narrow networks, no more narrow formularies. Uh, and it's really a matter of shifting the financing, but the delivery system would be freed up and become much more accessible. Um, I think there's really no legitimate way you can conclude that single payer would cost more than what we're doing now unless you have very distorted assumptions. And this is proven by the experience of other countries and by multiple, multiple economic analyses, uh, despite quibbles over the magnitude of the savings. Obamacare achieved no net gain. It has expanded the number with a health insurance card, but the expense of deteriorating quality of coverage, escalating deductibles and copays, shifting costs onto patients, rapidly escalating drug costs, narrow networks, formulary restrictions, few doctors taking Medicaid, extreme complexity, difficult for patients to buy and use, no effective cost controls, and very disru disruptive delivery and payment reforms. So is there an alternative? Neither Clinton nor the Republicans offer realistic solutions to the problems of health care costs and access. Clinton's incremental improvements that she is suggesting she would do would be opposed just as much as a wholesale replacement of the current system under Sanders' proposal, and both would be equally opposed by the Republicans. So unless we get a Democratic majority in both houses, uh, not too much is going to happen no matter which of them were president. All the Republican ideas are being repeated of privatizing Medicare and Medicaid, reducing regulation of health insurance, selling policies across state lines, granting tax credits and vouchers instead of guaranteed benefits, which basically means let's just turn over all of health care to the insurance companies wholesale. Trump's solution, I'm going to take care of everybody, it will be fabulous, but more recently he came out with exactly the same proposals as the Republicans have been saying for years. So this is the summary of the talking points. Any questions, comments, things you'd like me to elaborate on or that you want to ask anybody else about? Um, yeah, this is Jessica. I have a question. Um, so when we look at the, when we talk about how difficult, cumbersome, expensive this would be to implement, and we talk about the implementation of Medicare 50 years ago, uh, wouldn't it in fact be more complicated now because uh, Medicare was implemented in more of, of a vacuum? and there's more that has to be dismantled in order now to implement single payer? Well, I actually ask this question a lot when I speak. It kind of surprises me, people saying, the th thing pe people say, wouldn't this be hard to implement? And aren't the other thing they say is, aren't other countries that have done it successfully smaller? Um, so I'm well, that, interested. That is a good question. I think that it really depends on whether or not you can uh, eliminate the insurance model for financing health care. If you actually could say, okay, we're eliminating health insurance and starting a single payer program, you would be starting it from scratch. And uh, you would obviously do the, uh, the infrastructure for the single payer program before you eliminated the insurance system and then just switch over. The problem is it would be met with massive resistance from the health insurance industry because they were would be about to be bumped out of health care. And that's really the problem. If you could overcome that problem, if there was a political will to say we can no longer rely on the insurance model to finance health care, then it becomes just as easy to implement as Medicare was. But you still have to that, that's the if. That's the big if. Yeah, yeah, but but even if we did that and have the simple, which I would be very happy to get rid of all insurance companies, but yeah. you still have the you still have the problem of what to do with the insurance industry and all the people it employs and all all those things. HR six seven six does include job retraining for the people employed by the insurance industry, but it would be more expensive now than it was when HR 676 was proposed because the amount of, it, of bureaucracy has escalated markedly since then. So there's a lot of people you'd have to retrain. 
<coughs> Hello. <coughs> yes. Um, um, I have a concern with the comparison <clears throat> to all of the European single-payer systems since they all <clears throat> seem to be running out of money and the second layer of private insurance seems to be part of all of those systems. So I'm concerned when we just point to that, <clears throat> we're not being completely open and honest. Well, the, the thing about that is that... Uh, they're, when you say they're running out of money, they're already spending much less than we are. So the only reason that they're running out of money is there's reluctance to fund their systems. But it's not a matter of their systems being less cost effective. It's a matter of people don't want to pay more taxes, so there's a tendency to skip funding for their health care systems. But, and also the efforts to privatize some places like the Netherlands have resulted in increased costs, not saving. So, <coughs> you're still left with the most cost-effective model of single-payer and all the experiments trying to veer away from that have resulted in increased cost. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So hey, George Paul asked why has PNHP not had close relationship with Bernie and the reason is our tax status requires us not to get involved in endorsing political candidates. I have a question. Can I be heard? Yes. Uh, this is James. I'm in Missouri. And mine is kind of a logistics question about the tax code with Sanders and, you know, the 2.2 percent that will it's going to be effectively a premium. And the confusion I keep seeing is when that's applied. So if somebody has a gross income of whatever, and then they have deductions of whatever, then they're left with a, a taxable income. And as the taxable income, in other words, after the deduction, all gets plugged into those different uh, margins of 18,000, 22,000, yeah, I can't remember up to 250,000. <clears> was <throat> so that, uh, so is that tax only on the taxable income? So there's, there's both a payroll tax and a tax on, uh, on, on the employee's taxable income. And there have been a lot of economic models for single payer that have played with this you know, more or less of, of either the payroll tax or the individual tax. Uh, and you, you want to balance it so that both the individual and the business get some break, but they also continue to share in the responsibility. Well, let's say somebody fell into the category of 37%. Um, is all of their taxable income tax at 37 percent. It's not that's, broken that's down for each margin. Tax. Their their income above a certain point is taxed at 37 percent. Okay. Uh, Steve, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, George Martin, are you planning to put this all together in a publication, this comprehensive review? Uh, no. Why not? Uh, no time. <laughs> no time. Yeah, it would be very, very useful if, if it could be put together. There are, there are a lot of the articles I have, by, especially the ones by David and Stephanie, and Adam Gaffney, who had a nice review. So there already are some pretty good things. Yeah. Well, I think this is a bit more comprehensive. As far as the, yeah, well, I might think about it. And then a you know, quick other uh, question. Somebody brought up the Netherlands. Could somebody educate me about what drove that uh, uh, that privatization movement? And how, Basically, uh, I, I think what it is is that the... Can you hear me? The, yeah, I can hear you. The insurance industry approached the government and told them they would be able to save the money by privatizing. The uh, insurance industry said what? They sold the oh, I see that. on yeah. privatization. Yeah, uh, and is that is that evidence published somewhere? That alleged evidence? Yes, there have been uh, articles summarizing the Dutch experience. I believe they're available on the website if you look under Dutch health insurance. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Um. I'd like to ask you about the former single-payer supporters who now 
are are coming out against single payer. Uh, is, is, do you feel like this is strictly because they're Clinton supporters and it's, it's political in that way, or is there any other reason that they've now turned against single payer? And, and is there any hope of reversing that? There, there's a, probably a possibility of reversing that, but I can see no other plausible reason because many of those really did detailed analyses of single-payer proposals and they just changed their assumptions to eliminate all the savings that single-payer could gain. And I don't see any other reason for doing that than that they want to support Clinton and therefore they want to discredit Sanders. And unfortunately, even people like Paul Krugman, who I always thought was above that sort of thing, have fallen into it. Now, Ida says, I think only Clinton can win against Trump. It's probably true. Hey, I've got another question. Can you hear me? Yes. One is if we stay on, a, I mean, the argument is always, you know, the, Stay with the Affordable Care Act and incrementally improve it. And, and the, my concern is over 10 years, um, the uh, the inflation of you know it's going up in cost every year by 5.6 percent is what I saw. If you take 3.1 or 2 per, uh, trillion that we're spending now, and then over 10 years, you know, additional 5.6 percent each year, I calculate 45 trillion dollars spent in 10 years. Compared to the Sanders plan being basically 14 trillion over 10 years, is that what you get? Uh, I, I think that sounds plausible, and I do think that um, we have really not seen the net fallout from Obamacare, uh, both in terms of cost and in terms of disruptions to uh, care delivery. We now have a 55% burnout rate among American physicians. We have um, uh, escalating amounts of money being siphoned out of healthcare and into administration and I just don't see how this can continue without collapsing. Okay, thanks. Steve, we had a question earlier about whether it is still accurate to say that about 20 to 30 percent um, uh, still goes to insurance company profit. Is, is that still, number still accurate? Well, um, profit is probably less than that, but administration is the other question because um, Obamacare requires 80 to 85 percent actuarial value depending on the, or I mean medical loss ratio depending on the size of the insurance plan, which means that supposedly 80 to 85 percent of the healthcare dollar goes to healthcare and the rest can go to administration and profit and other things. The problem is that Obama negotiated with the insurance industry to count medical management as healthcare, not administration. And medical management is pharmacy benefit managers, utilization review, prior authorizations, all the things that are obstructing healthcare. And those things have escalated dramatically in the last five years. And they're all being counted as healthcare, not administration. So nobody knows. They can spend as much as they want on obstructing healthcare, and they can call it healthcare. So um, the whole medical loss ratio thing is, is just really messed up. I don't know. I don't know how much they're spending. Another thing that I was going to comment on about the experience of other countries like um, the Netherlands and Sw Switzerland also has, actually Switzerland, Germany, Japan, all of them have multiple payers. They have different health funds, but they require a unified delivery system so that <coughs> all the doctors can see anybody, anybody can see any doctor in any hospital, and they're all paid the same by all the different plans. So they can't compete on the basis of networks or on the basis of how they pay their doctors. Those are standardized. And that would be another option in the US is to go to what's called an all-payer system, where you have a unified delivery system with different payers paying into it. 
but whether you're um, Aetna or a local Medicaid managed care plan or whatever, you got to pay doctors the same and pay hospitals, pay into a, a fund that goes to the global budgeting of hospitals um, to participate in the system. And that would achieve probably 85% of the benefits of single payer uh, in terms of the administrative cost. And it wouldn't eliminate the insurance industry completely, but it would really disrupt their business model. Here's another question that it has to uh, do with control. Well, let's say we did a Sanders plan. And I'm still confused about control. Uh, so I understand there are going to be state boards, and those boards will be made up of physicians, nurses, patients, you know, business leaders, and that kind of thing on these boards and, and democratic with regard to what those boards find. But is there a federal or is it kind of an overall system, system control as well in addition to those? Uh, I don't know if that's been spelled out in detail, um, but I think you would need some kind of federal oversight uh, in addition to just um, having state local boards that dealt with the details at the state level. I'm sure you would need some of both. Hmm. HR 676 has both national and regional boards that would do similar things, but it's not specifically set up as, as state-based. I believe this, this uh, PowerPoint was distributed with the uh, notice of the meeting, so you should all be able to pull it off of there or it should be available on the PNHP website. Um, hello? Yes. Could, could I ask a question about, uh, this is uh, Ewell Scott from Kentucky, uh, a question about Taiwan's experience. It seems to be rather dramatic. Um, Taiwan went from very little system to a full single payer system very rapidly. And, uh, and it did result in marked reduction in health expenditures and improved access to care and had very dramatic benefits. It has, it has some flaws. It's tended to be underfunded and they don't pay their doctors very well, so there's been some dissatisfaction with that. But then there's political pressure to improve physician pay after a while and it goes through a cycle. But it really did get implemented rapidly. But that's because there was there there really was a vacuum there beforehand. All right. And they thought it through pretty well. I understand it uh, changed the disruption or the disparity in in healthcare outcomes between the rich and the poor. Also. Yes. Uh, this is George Martin again. I just want to make a comment about Taiwan. Uh, and one of the things that we neglect to point out about the advantage of single payer is that it, you get a tremendous advantage for epidemiological research to have a, a unified electronic database. And those folks in the Taiwan have been taking advantage of that. Uh, one uh, paper, not the best paper, but I remember seeing recently uh, more than one in the subject. Uh, they have detailed information about the, uh, the the extent of periodontal disease and the extent of its reversal by intervention by periodontists, and they correlate that with uh, the uh, prevalence of coronary artery disease, which has been a hypothesis that uh, deserves more research. But I can imagine a tremendous benefit for preventive medicine eventually. We don't we don't point that out enough. The advantages of a single payer. Pro, a program for research. I think that's a very good point. Both research and public health. That public health. You're right on preventive medicine. Uh, you see, you'll you'll you get evidence right away. There's a hot spot. Who knows for autism or a particular weird neoplasm. You get on top of it right away. Find out what's going on. Excellent, Excellent point. point. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions before we close out the call? Uh, if not, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. It's been excellent. Um, we'll make the video and the slides available. For
and thank you all. Thank you again, Steve. Thank yeah. you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very enjoyable. Thank you, Steve.